The cultivated advisors, we, we talk a lot about that when it comes to um, productivity and managing your schedule. D-U-E do versus D-O do. You need to figure out, okay, what are the, the baby steps that are going to take to get there? And then it's a matter of actually putting it in your calendar and holding you accountable to doing it. And that's actually the hardest part. Well, what's funny that you said is if you're not a slave to your calendar, you might just be a slave to your thoughts, right? So like something is going to pull you away and having that plan or that direction or that vision is what kind of helps keep you focused. For us here at Lil Jack, that's that's like our big thing going into next year is focus, saying no to more stuff so that we can actually stay on track because we will, as people, get pulled in different directions. It's so much of productivity or, uh, or being successful is just having that focus and that perseverance. Uh, so who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Elisa Ao and I am a karate athlete, Olympic hopeful slash business advisor with Cultivated Advisors. So uh, what makes you an expert or when did you cross that uh, threshold into becoming uh, an expert as a business advisor? The same thing. Like, I mean, I have the experience. I ran a business. It doesn't make me an expert per se, but it gives me the experience and the know-how to be able to help others be like, hey, I've been in your shoes before. Um, let me give you some advice. Let me give you some tools to help you uh, move forward to where you want to get to. So that's, uh, it's more like a, you know, senior uh, helper. <laughs> Just starting from the top. What does it mean to be an Olympic hopeful? So what it means to be an Olympic hopeful is that you have a chance to represent Team USA at the Olympic Games. Karate, it's, it's really like a one-time deal when it comes to the sport of karate. Some people have assumed that it's always been an Olympic sport because it's been the Pan Am Games because people see like martial arts in, in in Olympics, but actually it's only been judo and taekwondo. But we have been at big events like the Pan Am Games. We have our own world championships that are held every other year. So it's a very, very developed athletic sport. And so for karate, it's per weight class, 10 athletes. And so they're going to do this Olympic qualification tournament in Paris, which was supposed to happen in May of this year. And so from there, they were able to pick those last five. I'm competing in Paris in June and we'll see, like that's my spot. That's my one my one chance to, to get in. So to be at that level has got to be quite a, an honor. Or a, what does it mean to you to be in this position? It means so much for me to be in this position because I've actually been really, really blessed and really successful throughout my entire karate career. I was like junior world champion, junior Pan American champion. So I, I've been doing this for a while. I actually won three world championship titles uh, when I was 21 and 23 years old. And I'm um, the only American female to win a world championship. Super proud of my accomplishments, but I walked away from the sport in 2010, had two kids, <laughs> thought, my, thought my training days and competing days were over. 2017, I came back after seven years of not competing. The rules had changed, everything changed. Um, a year later, I tore my ACL in competition. <laughs> So to, to, to climb back from all of that, it, it means a lot for me to be that one person for U.S. to, you know, have a chance at the Olympics. You had mentioned that you had some trials in 2018, 2019. So, so what happened there? I, I, think I, I think I didn't take it seriously enough. I think I just over underestimated my competition and just assumed that I would just, you know, be that number one spot. And I didn't. I failed. I failed in 2018. I failed worse in 2019. When 2020 came around, I'm like, it's now or never. Like, if I don't get that number one spot in 2020, my whole Olympic journey is done. It's, it's done. Like, that, it's that or nothing. And so I was able to pull it off. I was able to get serious and figure out how to make it happen. And what I like about sports is that it does teach you perseverance at long-term goal setting because it's not something like you, you know, you fail on Monday, you go back Tuesday and win. Like you have to like go back and put in that effort and, and keep work, working towards it. So with the results of 2018 and 2019 of not qualifying, what, what happened next and what was your mindset going towards uh, 2020? Like I said, because of what I'd done before, I think I was just living too much in the past. When I failed the first time, I thought, okay, maybe I just had a bad day. But when 2019, when I didn't do it, I was like, okay, this is not okay. I need to get back to basics. You know, forget about everything that happened in the past. Forget about the world championships. Forget about any any accomplishment I had ever received or achieved in the past. The goal is to win the next team trial. That's the goal. I think I forgot that that graduated learning. I forgot that step-by-step -step process. Are you familiar with uh, Atomic Habits or have you read Atomic Habits? Mm -mm. 
So uh, it, it's a book and one of the concepts in it is uh, 1% uh, that you can improve things 1% at a time. There's actually a really good uh, uh, story in there about, I believe it was the British uh, cycling team. They lost the Olympics like really bad. And then they came back four years later and ended up dominating in almost like every category because the, the coach's approach was, let's just do 1% thing better every day. Let's tweak the bike here. Let's do this. Let's do that. And just focus on these, these micro adjustments over a four year period. And it had huge impacts uh, to their performance. It totally resonates with me. What I had to work on, like, let's just make sure that I can get point by point, match by match. That would lead to, to getting that number one spot in the U.S. team. And now that I've secured that, okay, now what are the next steps it's going to take to do the Paris tournament? So I'm not even thinking about the Olympics, really. I'm thinking about like this next tournament. And I think that's so important is that, yeah, you have a vision and you have a general direction of I'm going this way, which is the Olympics. That doesn't tell you what to do tomorrow, right? So like you have to then break it down to going, okay, so what is tomorrow? What's, what are those action items? What have you learned about breaking down these goals and visions that you can that you either apply in your practice or in business every successful athlete has a daily training plan like they're not just saying yeah olympics they don't just wake up in the morning and say yeah olympics and just like go out and train like there's an actual macro plan micro plan there's everything down to every second down to their nutrition down to their sleep habits everything first of all why why two million is, is that an ego thing or is there a real reason behind why you want to be at that number and then from there, like, okay, well, what does that break down to in terms of your sales? Okay, let's talk about that. And then, okay, how are you going to get to your sales? What does your sales pipeline look like? What does your marketing look like? Tons of parallels. And um, it, it's really helped me to be able to, like, tell stories. Uh, and what I really like about that is I think it really shines a light on the difference between behavior and outcome and how to focus on things. So, like, the outcome is, you know, getting to the Olympics. So, the outcome is having that $2 million uh, business. But you have to focus on what is the behavior, like what are you doing today, what are you doing tomorrow, and those behaviors will then impact or help you get to those outcomes. But you can't reach the outcomes if you don't understand what the behavior is, what you need to do. So knowing what the goal is, what's the strategy to get to the goal, and then what are the tactics that you're going to actually implement to make sure you get to that goal. So it's really breaking it down into really granular pieces. Uh, whenever I have a, something that is due or like the outcome of this task, that's the due date. Like it has to be done or produced at this time. So now I have to go back to the schedule and actually decide when things are going to be done. Do you have a model or do you have a process of how you address either personally or with your clients? The Cultivate Advisors, we, we talk a lot about that when it comes to um, productivity and managing your schedule. D-U-E do versus D-O do. You need to figure out, okay, what are the, the baby steps that are going to take to get there? And then it's a matter of actually putting it in your calendar and holding you accountable to doing it. And that's actually the hardest part. Like when you actually have to break it down, slow down so that you can speed up, right? So you slow down to do all the planning, you put the plan in your calendar. And I know a lot of people are really like hesitant about that at first. Like I'm not a slave to my calendar. It's like, well, if you don't put in your calendar, then you're just a slave to like all these thoughts in your head. And like, you know, it's just, it's just a lot more clarity. And then also, you know, when working with an advisor, you can, you can have that accountability piece too. So if I know that you want to implement something by a specific date, then I'm going to hold you accountable to that. So that really helps. It really like keeps the tension on things. And it's the same thing in sport with your coach, right? Like that's why you have a coach to keep, to hold you accountable. I think that's a great point. It's like, even at your level, you still have a coach, right? So it's like, even these businesses, whether you're successful or not, having that coach, that advisor, that network, that group is so impactful to accountability or just even thoughts or outside perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Like every athlete has a coach. When, when it comes to business, it takes superhuman power to be able to accomplish something on your own without anyone holding you accountable. I'd say even those people who can do it on their own probably could still benefit from a coach, but just of it is that having that outside perspective and accountability is so, so impactful. But what's funny that you said is if you're not a slave to your calendar, you might just be a slave to your thoughts, right? So like something is going to pull you away and having that plan or that direction or that vision is what kind of helps keep you focused. For us here at Little Jack, that's that's like our big thing going into next year is focus, saying no to more stuff so that we can actually stay on track because we will, as people, get pulled in different directions. It's so much of productivity or, uh, or being successful is just having that focus and that perseverance. What have you learned about perseverance through your journey here? I've learned that nothing Nothing ever comes easily <laughs> like that is certainly what I've what I've learned it all takes it all takes repetition it all takes commitment but I think it translates so well into the business world even if you're not a business owner 
um, just into like your work ethic. Like how do you set goals for yourself as an adult and actually make sure they happen? Well, it takes a lot of grit and perseverance. Nothing comes easy. When you have something like maybe martial arts where it's a clear step, so maybe it's certain ranking or you know that there's a certain direction or there's at least a structure of like what you can work towards. But for a business, sometimes it's pretty free form. How does perseverance play into something like that when you don't necessarily know if it will work or where it's going? Like a lot of fulfillment in setting goals that are just have to do with like your wellness and happiness hitting a certain point in your business where you have enough time to spend with your family and your and your kids maybe that's important to you like I think it, it really comes down to peeling back to figure out what your why is um, and I think that's super important for any business owner is always figuring out their why because otherwise you should probably just look for a, a job you know and um, if you can keep that in mind that's where grit comes into play to, to get you there okay let's say you might not get the outcome or the outcome changes or it might develop over time depending on the new information you get in your experience but that behavior and that development on self those are things that people can't take away from you and can help add to what you do next and or could be applied in ways you didn't even think of in, in the beginning well i think um it's it's just really important to to remember the journey and the, the the takeaways from from all of that that you've put into that that effort into getting to that goal. And even if you don't get to that goal, well, that grit, that determination, that planning, that commitment that you put into getting there can certainly be transferred into other parts of your life. And one thing that you mentioned that that was interesting too is that we all go through these struggles, but and we and then people in general might have certain milestones and growing points that we can all relate. The thing we gotta remember is at the end of the day, that story is unique to us. And that's one of the things is sometimes we just need to take some time to reflect on what we're doing and really appreciate that maybe not achieving our outcomes, but we, if we're going through the effort of getting there and that perseverance and that grit, we are building something that can be usable or useful one day, even if we don't see it now. It is, it's important to figure out what makes you unique and the fast the of choices that we have. What, what's your journey when it comes to leadership and leadership development? You look at karate and you're like, it's one person fighting another person. How much more individual can you get? But think about the training that goes into something like a combat. With my training, I do see it as a team sport, 100%. So it's my coach right there, but it's my teammates behind me. It's my training partners back at home. It's my physical conditioning coaches. There's a team. What I found with leadership with my when I ran the martial arts business is like I had to lead by example and that because that's the way that I felt was most effective. I always felt like I'm going to show you how I'm doing it too and we're going to do it together. We might not be doing the exact same task like I've got something for you because that's your position in the company and this is my position but I'm going to show you by example what you know that I'm I'm putting in the effort too. In those types of situations when it's a skill set or a task that you don't know as a leader like how does that translate how does leading by example translate into those situations? In that example, I would say like, hey, I want to align with the developer first to make sure that, you know, my vision and what I want is really clear with you. And so that we're aligned on that. We know what our goal is, where we want to get to. And then I'm going to check in with you along the way while I'm working on other complementary uh, item that is going to lead us to our goal. You're doing your portion and I'm checking in with you and I'm learning uh, along the way. I don't feel like I'm ever going to be that expert that you are in that specific field. But I am learning, I am respecting, and I'm holding you accountable too. So just know that even though I can't specifically do the skill set that you have been trained to do, that you have the experience to do, I'm learning along the way enough where I can hold you accountable and make sure that we that we rise together. Yeah, it's really great because essentially you're showing them that you're committed to them, that you're committing with your time by like showing up to the meetings, by potentially preparing for these meetings. And that's the same expectation you have from them. Uh, so like you're not expecting them to do your job just as you're not going to do their job, but you're expecting them to you know participate, to have an open mind, to listen, to grow. And, and, and that's the example that you're trying to demonstrate. How, how do you practice active listening? One is like you have to try to get rid of the distractions and the so difficult this day and age, but just really trying to eliminate those those distractions as much as possible. And then the other thing too, I like you to repeat back, you know, the mirroring. So, you know, when we're having these conversations, echoing back, putting it into your own words, not just not just hitting replay, but really trying to put it into your own words and repeat back to them to make sure that they um, that you understood exactly what they were trying to explain to you. And if not, like just keep that process going until you get to that point. I think that's super important when it comes to active listening. Communication is really hard. There's a lot of things that go into it that we just take for granted because we do it on a regular basis. 
but everything from like the relationship you have with the person to the context or to your pre-context of what's going on. I think if we started to break it down and really look at what is happening with communication, we could all be more effective communicators. Spending a little time on personal development can go a long way. You know, as an adult, it's really helpful to continue to invest in yourself. It's not even that we're not even taught it. We're actually through experience taught the opposite, like through our culture, because we're taught that things move fast. You have to get things done, like act now. Uh, like the, between media and computers, like I, the pace of everything is just naturally growing. And a lot of times we just don't have that level of awareness. I think it actually goes back to, we're just not taught awareness to be able to identify these things. For me, my, my experience with this is when I went in, a, I lived in a country for three years where I didn't speak the language and everyone acted diff differently than what I'm used to. Uh, where I was living in, people spoke more slowly. They took the time to respond. Differing from American culture, it was very, one person speaks, than the next person, not at the same time or over each other. So like to me, it was getting used to, and I was being like the rude one when I wanted to jump in and say something because the thought popped in my head. That forced me to kind of learn some aspects of active listening because I had to let the person finish speaking. And then there's a lot of that validation because of the language barrier. So a lot, of, a lot of times, like whether it's me or them, just naturally had to ask, is this what you mean? Otherwise things would for sure be lost. That's one thing I really wish I could do in my lifetime is I do want to learn another language fluently, but working with people where English is their second language, I have a lot of experience with that. And in that, I've learned a lot about validation and slowing down. And so that's been a huge learning point for me as a leader is just making sure like, wait, you heard me, but repeat back because I want to make sure you actually understand what I'm saying. And just a big learning thing for me when it comes to um, leadership. And so you said uh, it all starts with you and it can be applied to personal growth, leadership and entrepreneurship. What drives you to say that? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess going back to like my whole sports background, I have my support staff, I have my coaches who, who believe in me. But at the end of the day, like I'm the one on the mat doing it. Like I'm the person that it, it all comes down to me and I have to own it. And that really resonates with me when it comes to running a business or helping other business owners. How do you react to the outside situations? What are you doing proactively to, you know, move the needle in the direction that you want to go to? Is there something wrong with the system that's going on in the business? It all comes down to like figuring out, just peeling back the layers and figuring out what is going wrong here? What is the failure? And what can I do as the as the captain of the ship? What can I do to, to change that? There's no uh, set number of answers or, you know, right or wrong. There's a spectrum of things that could be done, but at the end of the day, it's your decisions needed to get to this position. In martial arts, if you're on your back and the match is over and you lost, do you go, okay, that person was better than me? Yeah, probably, right? That's why you lost, right? <laughs> but, but what do you do next? Like, what happens now? What happens tomorrow? Like, where do we go from here? So you can't make that person worse. You can't lower their skill, but you can improve what you can do. You, you, you make the decisions of what happens now that this is the reality of the situation. What's the one piece of advice that you'd give to someone watching or that you'd hope they take away from today's conversation? Everyone has had life experiences uh, growing up, going to school, any other activities and relationships that you've had in the past. Um, there's always something to be learned from it. And that can certainly be applied to what's going on in your life now or what's going on in the future. And so when I'm speaking specifically about business, uh, I can learn so much from past experiences that I've had through sports, through everything else. And then also continuing to do that lifelong learning. So like there's learning at every level and it just takes that openness and that looking for the opportunity to learn at every step.